Hi everybody, my name is David Thompson. I'm responsible for Marine Solutions at Aviva, which is of course a large software for industrial automation and shipbuilding and engineering design tools. Um, in this lecture, 25 to 30 minutes, I want to talk about digital twins in the marine industry. Um, I'll be using, of course, Aviva's products because they are used to create digital twins uh, to explain to you um, the various fidelities and the various elements of digital twins in the marine industry. Um, so digital twins, of course, mean different things to different players in the marine industry. If you're a shipbuilder, we typically think about the 3D model as being the digital twin and all of the documentation associated with it. If you're in operations, you typically think of either live operational data being your digital twin or simulations of how the vessel should behave as being your digital twin. I'm going to talk you through most of these topics in today's lecture and um, of course there will be many details that I'm not able to cover but you're of course welcome to contact me at Aviva to find out more about that. So I'm going to start by looking at uh, the information backbone. So this is really the core and as it sounds the backbone of a digital twin for us at Aviva. It's basically where you store all of what we call the reference information for the digital twin. So the fundamental definition of a vessel it starts in the information backbone. We're using a product called Aviva Asset Information Management. And as you can see here, I'm doing a search. And this search is basically just looking for anything with the word uh, pump in it. As you can see there, I've got 114 results. This quite typically on a real vessel, this is uh, our demo vessel, of course. On a real vessel, this would be hundreds of thousands of data entries. And the reason that's so many is not because there's hundreds of thousands of pumps on a vessel, but a pump as, a, as an object in a digital twin has a variety of different data sets and, and other information which is connected to it. So we take our pump as an object, it's going to have some attributes which are, for example, manufacturer, um, pressure head, electrical consumption. So that would be a, a basic data set. We would then connect it to, for example, data set coming from a diagram. So X, Y location on the diagram, name of the diagram, person who's created the diagram, for example. So the beginnings of a digital twin is what we call one dimensional data. So it's attribute data, text information. And this information can be generated by importing quite typically um, an Excel sheet or a report or a Word document of some kind. So this view that I'm showing you now is what we call a tag summary. It shows you all of these data sets which are associated with that logical object of a pump, so the digital definition of the pump, multiple data sets. But we can also see, uh, so for example, this is uh, logistics information associated with it. We can also see that it's come from this Excel sheet, which you can see in the bottom left hand side there, which is the original place where this pump was written down for the first time in the life cycle of this vessel. Um, so data for the digital twin begins in Excel sheets. It begins on pieces of paper. It begins on a maker's list very typically, but it becomes enriched with information as you put more information into your information backbone. So you can see here, this pump has five data sets from CAD, from the production system, from the procurement system. It's an assembly on a project plan somewhere. It's a part of two logical groupings or areas. So it's a pre-outfitting area and a, and, a, and a compartment. And this is the fundamental concept of the information backbone and what we call the reference digital twin. So the second thing that we typically see um, is that drawings are the second level of information which is imported into your digital twin backbone. So of course there are many drawings which are created in the early phases of ship design, scantling drawings, classification drawings, general arrangement, uh, functional diagrams or principal diagrams. And all of these things are still today two-dimensional deliverables, electronic, but they're two-dimensional. 
And what we can do with our information backbone is that we can import them and extract information from these diagrams. So on this diagram, there are valves, as you can see here. And we know that these are valves because of either information which is in the block on that drawing or the sort of uh, what we call sub picture in Aviva Speak. Or it could be information which is simply scraped from this, uh, if it's a PDF, for example, uh, through the naming convention. So you can see there there's a FW minus V minus nine. And that's the kind of naming convention that we can understand and turn into the definition of a valve. Um, so this is typ typically second layer of information is bring in drawings and you can have a, a digital twin that only exists of drawings, diagrams and data which is imported from um, what I'd call, uh, um, yeah, sort of 1D information. So databases, Excel sheets, um, Word documents. Um, and we then, of course, have a 3D model. So I'm going to skip ahead. And the 3D model in Marine is essentially, uh, there are several types of 3D models. So the model you're seeing here, I'm just going to stop the video uh, for a moment. This is a model from what we call the shipbuilding coordination model. So this is the model that will have the full ship. And of course, we can do that for vessels as big as the All Seas Pioneering Spirit, for example. Um, but it's a full ship. But what you'll find about these shipbuilding coordination models is that the level of detail is relatively low. So the pipes will be exactly the diameter and exactly the location that they should be. The same with the HVAC system, the cable trays. But things like those bow thrusters, which you can see at the front, will be simplified because that's something that's a, a vendor package delivered by Brunvall or whoever makes bow thrusters these days um, as a mechanical model. So they'll have a fully detailed model of that, but you don't need that full mechanical model in order to coordinate and do your production model, which is what we're looking at here. Um, I'll go a little bit more into detail on 3D models. But the other kind of information that we typically would associate once we get a physical uh, version of this vessel existing is photographs, laser scans, um, photogrammetry models, anything which can be captured. And of course, it's getting a lot easier. You have uh, phones with LiDAR and the ability to create 3D models these days. Um, we can create 360 videos and all of this information can be networked together into the information backbone and this provides us with the reference information. So what was designed, what was specified, what was designed, what was built and how does it actually look today? And this is what we call um, effectively static reference data. So it does change, especially in the design phase, but this data exists, it's put into the database and it's used as reference. So this is basically the layers of the digital twin um, it reference information that we generally call it. So I'm going to pause my video and then go and have a look at 3D model in a little bit more detail. Very. So 3D models in shipbuilding are a key part of the digital twin. Um, this is a rather old 3D model actually made in Tribon, which is of course the legacy design system from Aviva. Um, you're looking at it in our game engine, which is called XR Studio which is why we have this nice rendering. We've got shadows, um, we've got nice lighting going on here, but the model itself is directly coming from a Tribon model. And as you can see here, um, shipbuilding coordination models like this, basically the hull structure, we define everything. So if I fly up here, we can see here brackets, um, stiffening underneath this deck here, the main beam structure, we go over to the side here, we'll see the cutouts here as the stiffeners pass through. So it's a fully detailed 3D model. And sometimes uh, the representation of stiffeners is simplified, for example, twisted and curved stiffeners. We tend to simplify that for graphical performance reasons, but the data which is stored in our database is, in, is exact and so much so that we can, of course, control a robot with it that will go and cut or bend a pipe based on that information. So 3D models are somewhat simplified in the shipbuilding world. Uh, here's a valve 
which I'll just fly down to. You can see here it's very much simplified. We don't see the hand wheel properly. We don't see the body of the valve properly. Usually a cast iron thing with a stamp on it from the manufacturer because we don't need that level of detail in order to coordinate or build this. Behind the scenes, however, this valve in the information backbone will have a manufacturer, it will have a material number, it will have a serial number so that we can exactly trace which valve from which manufacturing plant did this valve come from. So that's part of the digital twin is combining together that reference information which I've just shown you in asset information management with the 3D models here. So the next typical step for a digital twin is to make this somehow dynamic. So at the moment, this is a static 3D model. It shows us where everything is in relationship to everything else, but not much else. I mean, th there's a huge value in having this reference model. First of all, it allows you to go and build it very precisely, <clears throat> reducing the kind of rework you have to do in the shop floor. But the next step would be, how do we make this into something dynamic? So by dynamic, I mean, what about if we started to model some of the systems which are inside this vessel? So as you'll see when I go into the engine room here, <clears throat> there are a lot of systems inside such a vessel. If I can find the engine room, it's uh, forward, this vessel. So as you can see here in the engine room, loads of pipes, loads of systems. And of course, we all know that there's a cooling system, a lubrication oil system, um, the generator system, an emergency backup generator. All of these things are on pretty much every diesel powered vessel these days or fuel oil powered. Um, we have a definition of how they should work in a diagram. We have a 3D model that shows us how the layout and how they are coordinated in three dimensional space. The next step would be to then simulate some of these processes. And this is of course what we can do in, our, in a simulation engine. So Aviva have a process simulator, a family of process simulators that allow you to simulate thermodynamic systems or any kind of major process. So that would be something that is going on behind the scenes in this 3D model. And if we start to combine these things together with a dynamic 3D model, we can then simulate what could be going on uh, inside these pipes, for example. So I'm going to switch to a video to show you the next part of this demonstration. So at Aviva, we have a game engine, which I've just shown you uh, with that ship 3D model. It's called XR Studio. And this game engine allows us to connect a 3D model to a variety of different simulation engines behind the scene. So the process simulator, dynamic simulator, thermodynamics, these kind of things. And this is, of course, extremely useful for uh, training. So as you can see here, somebody's opening a valve by pointing at it. They're in VR in this case. And you can see there the valve position is being uh, opened. Behind the scenes, it's possible to connect that valve position to a dynamic control system simulator. Um, in this case, we're showing um, a training scenario. So the user has a list of things to do. So take the bolts off of this cover of this control panel, probably have to turn off the electricity first, and then you can go in there and do your maintenance. So this is the next level of the digital twin is to start to make this three-dimensional model into something which is dynamic. So, and the game engine plays that key role in terms of making that three-dimensional model into something dynamic. So as you can see here, we've got fire, we've got water simulated, we've got the, the, the movement of a user around the 3D model simulated in the form of an avatar. And as I mentioned before, it's possible to um, combine the 3D model with pro pro complex process simulations. So behind the scene here, there's a process simulation running, which is telling us what's the fill level of, I think it's a column or a condenser in this case, 
And that's really the full potential of a digital twin is when you can combine simulation models with the three-dimensional model and of course all of the reference information about how something should be operated, how it should be connected from that engineering specifications. So I'm going to switch uh, to something else just to show you um, a final part of this video. Okay, so I've now shown you that we have reference information in the digital twin. We have the 3D model or laser scans uh, as a major component of the digital twin. And I've shown you that with a game engine, you can start to combine simulated behavior together with the 3D model for training purposes, uh, mostly that's where the most value is. But I've switched over here to, there's actually a game called Stormworks to show you about the next level of the digital twin. So this Stormworks game allows us to model ships. It's not the main point of this, but most importantly, it allows us to model um, basically all of the things inside this vessel that might be generating information. So what you can see in my screen just now is basically all of the, what we call IOs, so inputs and outputs from everything on board this vessel. So a good example that we'll all understand is the rudder. So it's actually got four rudders here. And if I click over the rudder, you can see here that it's got an input output in the form of a number, which determines the rotation of the rudder. So that's what we mean by input and outputs. So this is just a, a toy ship, if you like. It's, it's a game, it's a very simplified ship, but you can see here, there are hundreds, if not thousands of IOs, even on this very simple, version of a ship. I'm going to bring this ship into the game world. So this actually allows us to simulate. So you can see there all of the parts of the vessel are moving. And it allows us to simulate basically all of those IOs on board this vessel. So I'm going to go into this vessel and I'm going to go into the engine room. And we're going to have a look at the values that the virtual sensors are generating on board this vessel. So here's our engine room. And if I look at this engine room and press this button, we'll see here there's a variety of different data points which this virtual engine is generating. So the throttle position is zero, the starter is off, zero RPS. The temperature you can see there is increasing and this is because I've spawned it into a world which has an ambient temperature, so that will come up to about 20 degrees. There's no fuel, air or exhaust flow through the pipes here, and there's no um, power being generated. There is an electrical um, signal going to these engines, however, and that's from a, a, a one which would be 100% battery, and you can see here the battery is running down very slowly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start this engine virtually, and we'll see how those things change. And of course, the point here is I'm just gonna cheat and fly up to the bridge. Excuse me, uh, there we are. So this is a simulation of this vessel. Um, all of those input and outputs and sensors are simulated, as you can see here. I'm just gonna sit in the captain's seat. You can actually see that the engine is now running uh, and that the temperature is coming up. Instruments on board the bridge are what we would call a form of telemetry. So it's telemetering from the Greek. Um, basically, uh, we are viewing uh, something which is being recorded far away, only on the bridge. And if I now go back down into the engine room um, and look at the data which is being generated by this engine. We'll see here the throttles at um, sort of one out of 100. So it's just on tickover. The start is off. It is turning. The temperature is increasing as you'd expect. There's a fuel to air ratio of, what's that, one to, can't work it out, one to 10 approximately. The exhaust pipes are uh, flowing. Um, and I can't remember, yeah, there's in, yeah, so there's cooling water coming in and cooling water going out, and it's generating 4.9 units of power, whatever those units are. 
So the reason I'm showing you this game engine is to talk about the next phase of digitalization, which is to take this physical uh, asset, the physical vessel, and to start to collect information from it. But not onto the bridge of the vessel, but to collect this data, send it via satellite, combine it with the digital twin, which is typically sitting back in the management office of the vessel. And this is where we get, and I'm gonna switch over to uh, my browser again. Um, and this is where we get what we call the IoT of ships. And this is the final component of the digital twin. So Smart Vessel Optimizer is a product from one of our partners, the company is called TechBinder, and they use Aviva software behind the scenes to collect data from the vessel. So this is the typical setup. You have a physical IoT box. This is installed in the server room or in the bridge of the vessel. Inside the box, so it's a self-contained unit, is a sensor, G uh, sensor suite, GPS antenna, connectivity suite so that it can send the signal via the satellite or via LTE connection and a data historian. So a computer with a hard disk and a database on it that can effectively collect the data from those sensors which I've just shown you in the game, but from the real ones and it can connect them, collect them, excuse me, over long periods of time. So I think this box can collect uh, for about a year um, I can't remember, 10,000 data points. Um, of course, that data is then sent back to the shore where the people on the shore are building dashboards from this information. So there's some examples here about utilization, fuel efficiency, where the vessel is, how it's being operated, the speed it's being operated at. These are all examples of the kind of operational insights that can be gained from connecting real-time operation data with um, other, other things. So this uh, solution here is particularly looking at near real-time data or it's, they're actually storing this, of course, um, over time and then looking for trends. And this is the next big revolution in digital twins, taking real-time data or what we call operational data and then looking at it, analyzing it on shore, using machine learning very often to figure out the behavior of this vessel to figure out when it's being operated correctly or how it's being operated to figure out things like um, are the pumps and the air conditioning fans in my engine room oversized or undersized but based at looking at the actual data so this concept is not new you know, if you look at um, formula one cars they've been doing it since the 80s i believe Telemetry in its very basic form has been used in many industries for a long time, but it's relatively new in the marine industry. And the ultimate vision, of, of course, is when we start to connect telemetry to the digital twin. So here's a, a small video showing you the potential of this. We've got our 3D model of the vessel. We can make it interactive. We can use it as a basis for simulation with fire, and we can make all the buttons interactive in it with the game engine, but we can also connect it, as you can see here, to, um, this is Wonderware in this case, but it would could be the OSI Pi system as well, uh, where we're connecting an object, in this case a scrubber, to some real-time operational data. So that's um, the sort of core content about um, the digital twin you've seen how it can be built up from 1D, 2D, 3D data. We've seen how we can add a layer of simulation to that and then experience that in virtual and augmented reality. Um, and we've seen here how the sort of final component part of a digital twin is to take real data from the real vessel, combine it with your digital twin behind the scenes, your information backbone, your simulations, and use that in order to get a variety of different operational insights. So that's all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you've got any questions, please feel free to reach out to me uh, at Aviva.